I'm drawn to the life of Simon Peter. As the video said, he, he was passionate, he was bold, and I also find that Simon was so raw and so real. Like many of us in this room, he was driven, he was a go-getter, kind of one of those people, personalities that's ready, fire, aim. Anyone else in this room? But while he was full of potential, he was full of shortcomings, and when the tension in his life ramped up, fear and uncertainty began to creep in. In one moment, Peter would say one of the most profound things you've ever heard and just hit the nail on the head. And not long after that, he was falling flat on his face. And just as the Gospels, first and foremost, through the person of Jesus Christ, show us who God is, God's love, his faithfulness, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, in so many ways, Peter in the Gospels shows us who we are. Fragile, human, great strength, yet flawed. Can anyone relate to Peter? Does any of this sound familiar? Well, full disclosure this morning, it's not just the personality of Simon Peter that draws me to him. And truth be told, the sermon that you're going to hear this morning is a sermon that I need to preach to myself. Because it's so easy in life to get caught up in the to-do list, the tasks, to check boxes. And over the past few months, I've been realizing that there's times where I get to the end of my day and I say, hey, mission accomplished, we did a lot, but also wonder, "Ah, is there something more? And we're going to find today when we turn to Luke chapter 5 and we look at the calling of Simon Peter in Luke chapter 5. That, that Peter in his encounter with Jesus Christ finds unstoppable purpose. It gets beyond the to-do list, the checklist, the job description, the responsibilities of the day. And in his encounter with Jesus, he finds that his whole life is reordered. He finds so much more and everything is put into perspective. And I'll be honest with you this morning, my my purpose and my desire is that this unstoppable purpose found in Jesus Christ would be true of my life and that it would be true of yours as well. So if you would, if you have your Bibles with you, your phones, pull them out and turn with us to Luke chapter 5. And while you're doing that, I just want to share with you and highlight uh, this book, Simon Peter, Flawed and Faithful Disciple by author Adam Hamilton. It is a great resource for diving deeper into the life of Peter. It was a great resource for me in prepping for our time together today. And we have a handful of copies available in the bookstore. If you would like to grab one after the service today, I'd encourage you to do so. But let's start reading together in Luke chapter 5. Verse 1. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around Jesus and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. Let's start by unpacking the setting of the story a little bit. This is taking place on the shores of the Lake of Gennesaret, which we may more commonly know as the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is probably a little bit less of a sea as we would think of it and a little bit more like a large lake. If we were to talk about the size of the Sea of Galilee, in square miles it would roughly be the size of Washington, D.C. So it's not small, it's a big lake. But if you picture Washington, D.C., take away the city because that's not the setting at all. The Sea of Galilee is surrounded by hills, by countryside, by some smaller cities and a few towns scattered about. And amazingly, in the last 2,000 years, it doesn't look all that different than it would have looked like in Jesus' day. I've never been to Israel, but of all the places that I'm most excited to go one day when I do go there, it's the Sea of Galilee. I enjoy nature. I enjoy calm. I like being able to hear myself think, and I look forward to one day standing on those shores and just soaking in the surrounding 
areas. On the north shore of the Sea of Galilee is the town of Capernaum, and not far from there would be a small little fishing village called Bethsaida. This was the home of Peter for his work. He had a house in Capernaum as well, but here in Bethsaida was where he would operate his business from. And interestingly enough, the exact site of this has been debated, and it's not quite sure exactly where it is. But if you go onto YouTube and you look up El Araj, there is a site in the last five years that has been excavated that has revealed some incredible things that's worth looking into further and is a possible site for where Bethsaida might have been. Either way, here we are on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and we find that there are fishermen who have gotten out of their boats and are washing their nets. This would mean they were at the end of their work day. Washing nets was very important for their livelihood because if nets got dirty, stinky, rotted, cracked, they would eventually become useless and they would have to get new ones, which would be very expensive. Also, the fact they were washing their nets meant that they were at the end of their work day. Net fishing was most commonly done at nighttime when fish could not see the nets. So they'd start off at dusk, go out into the water, and spend an entire night dropping their nets into the water, dragging through the water, and picking up fish as they went. So here they are at the end of their work day. They're cleaning up, and as we'll read a little bit in verse 5, they haven't caught a thing all night long. They've worked hard, they're tired, and they're no doubt disappointed. And this gives us the setting for the rest of our story. Well, sometimes in these settings, when we're just going on with life, Jesus is about to bring some disruption. Let's look at verse 3. It says, and Jesus got into one of the boats. Wait, pause there for a second. Jesus just got into one of the boats. It's so casually, so shortly noted. Is that how it works? I don't know what the cor- cultural norms were back then, but it, yeah, it says that. Jesus just got into one of the boats. Happened to be Simon's boat. And I don't know what Simon was thinking at the time, but I had a similar experience recently. I've been... Um, meeting some of my new neighbors, and we've been playing some pickleball. Now, someone informed me in the last service that pickleball is one of the fastest growing sports in America, but many of you know it as the thing that retired people play, right? So you're asking, why, Greg, are you playing pickleball? Well, I play pickleball in golf, and as one person wisely advised me, it is never too early to start planning for retirement, so I've got my bases covered. We're good to go. But we're playing pickleball, and to make this story even more intriguing, my friend, my neighbor that I was playing pickleball with, has a YouTube channel where he reviews uh, electric vehicles, e-bikes, electric appliances, all these different things um, that are battery-powered, and he's been doing this for years, and companies send him free stuff. So that day, he rode to the pickleball court on his roughly $2,000 free e-bike that he got for reviewing him online. And he parked it at the court next to us while we played pickleball. Well, while we were playing pickleball, this other gentleman came over who was wanting to use the court, and he went over to move his bike. Now, imagine for yourself in a setting like this. You've got a nice bike. Someone comes over and touches it. And just like anyone else would do, my friend yells over, Hey, what are you doing? Startled the guy a little bit. They had a little conversation, worked things out. We got the bike moved. Everything was good. In this situation, however, it's going to be like this gentleman who we didn't know hopped on the bike, said, hey, mind if I take a ride? Jesus is in Simon's boat and asks him to put out a little way from the land. Now, this may not have been the first time that Simon met or knew of Jesus. Jesus, um, no doubt, had encountered Simon, but Simon was not a follower of Jesus at the time. He was still a fisherman. In Luke chapter 4, we have the uh, recorded story of Simon's mother-in-law being healed by Jesus. 
But we don't know if Simon was there. We don't know if the time frame between what happened. We don't know how informed Simon was. No matter what the case, this story is intriguing both ways. So Jesus asked Simon to push, uh, he's in the boat, top in the boat with him and push out a little bit from land. And Jesus sits in the boat and begins teaching people from the boat. Have you ever been asked to do something that you didn't want to do? Put yourself in Simon's shoes. You've been, worked all, you've been working all night, hard physical labor. You've got nothing to show for it. In all practical purposes, it's been a failure. And this isn't just putting some fish on the table. This is your livelihood. This is your career. You're not happy about how the night went. You've washed your nets, and no doubt you're ready for sleep. And Jesus says, would you mind taking me out in the boat? Maybe this is how some of you felt a few weeks ago when you were asked to volunteer for VBS. Maybe some of you feel this way being here today. Maybe you felt dragged along the church or you woke up this morning and you didn't want to be here, whether in person or online, and you're just like, uh, I'll show up anyway, okay? Sometimes Jesus asks us to do things that we don't want to do. And Peter here learns right away that Jesus has no problem disrupting his plans. Were you aware of this? Jesus has no problem disrupting your plans. Have you had that happen? And for Peter, this is not going to be the last time. In fact, Jesus disrupts his plans next in the next verse. But it continues to happen. What I find really intriguing, though, in this is the simple fact that Jesus gave Peter something to do. So often in church, the way that we think that we invite people to church is to say, hey, come to church where you get to sit and listen. And you can sing and you can participate, but that's, that's what there is for you to do. Come sit, listen, experience. Imagine if you went to your friend who doesn't go to church and says, um, will you come to church with me on Sunday? And uh, by the way, you're running sound. But if you think about it, and I think this is true of most people, but for I can speak as, a, as, as guys especially, we don't want to sit around. We want something to do. Give me a task. Give me something I can get my hands on. There's a call to action here, and so often discipleship isn't just a sit and participate or just know, it's come do something. Because Jesus could have very well said to Simon, hey, I'm about to preach an amazing sermon. Why don't you sit on the hillside here and listen to me? But he says and said, no, come, take me out in your boat. Just yesterday we had our men's breakfast. We could say to a friend, come with the men's breakfast, but we could also say, hey, come with me to the men's breakfast. We're going to show up an hour early and set up the chairs. You heard the announcement for the global leadership coming up in August. We could show up to that, and that would be amazing. We'd get a lot out of it. But we could also bring someone else along with us, or even better yet, we could challenge somebody we know who doesn't even go to this church and say, what if you were to host five people at the global leadership summit? What if we were to bring some of our friends, our coworkers together and experience this together? Suddenly there's action and there's ownership involved. And honestly, I think sometimes in the church we have the mindset, no, no, we do things for other people. That's our job as Christians. You ever consider that sometimes ministry is asking to be served? Sometimes ministry and the thing that God may use is when we actually have to reach out and say, I need help. That's what Jesus did here. Jesus had all the power of the universe, but in this moment, he didn't have a boat. And there was Simon Peter with a boat, and he was the man for that time. And Jesus said, Simon, will you come out? Will you take me out on the water? And so Jesus is teaching, and you realize Simon is now stuck. I don't know if he considered this. He probably did, but he is now out in the boat, and all he had was the opportunity to listen, to take a nap, or zone out. Kind of the options that you guys have this morning. 
And I don't know which one he chose. The story doesn't tell us. But no doubt he was caught up in everything that was happening there. He was right in the middle of it. He could not sneak out the back. He was in the boat with Jesus. And friends, similarly, it's so true that sometimes what we need is just a little disruption in our life. Something that gets us outside of our norms, our plans, something that disrupts our agenda and gets us going in a different direction. And before we dive deeper into the story today, I have to ask you this. Where is Jesus trying to disrupt your life? It probably isn't just happening now right here this morning. It's probably already been happening. Things that aren't going the way that you plan. Things that you're, you're giving your best effort, but it's not just coming together. Ways that God's been gently nudging you, not there, but here. Let go of this. Take hold of that. Because at this moment, Jesus is going to take it a step further and disrupt him even more. It says in verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Huh? Once again, I fished all night. I'm tired. I failed. I'm disappointed. I just listened to you preach a whole sermon. And I'm, I'm ready for bed. It's nap time. I know that the fishing is not good during the day. Peter had lots of ex legitimate excuses. And honestly, a lot of times we do too. He says in verse 5, Master, we've worked hard all night and we've caught nothing. That's not a made-up excuse. That's reality. Peter is just being raw and real. He's being honest. We have tried all night long. We are fishermen. We do this. This is what we do, and we failed. The nets are folded. They're washed. They're clean. I'd rather not put them back in the water. Once again, all legitimate thoughts. But so often in life, is it not true that the disruptions we experience and the disappointments that we're dealing with often lead to our disobedience? Life's been disrupted. It's not what I wanted it to be. I'm wrestling with the chaos of that. There's disappointments. There's emotional pain. There's weights that I'm carrying that I, that I didn't anticipate having to carry. And so what God's calling me to do, no, I'd rather just do what just feels good for me right now. I'd rather soothe. I'd rather numb. I'd rather distract myself. I'd rather just go on with life as normal and not have to think about what God's trying to say to me right now because that's too hard. And in the last few weeks as I was preparing for this sermon, I, I bumped up against my own wall with these things and realized that in my own life that my disruptions, my disappointments, for me too, can lead to disobedience. Um, Danita, during the announcements, earlier mentioned that we have switched over to a new payment portal for um, gifts given to the church. And part of my job as the communications pastor is to help uh, draft emails to send to the, uh, to the congregation to help people be informed and knowledgeable about this transition. And it's gone incredibly well. The communication's been fun. It's been fun to partner with people as we've taken this step forward and look to improve the giving experience. And then somewhere through it, I realized, okay, I moved here six months ago from California We've had a lot going on. We uprooted our family. We bought a new house. We've been working on the house. Our routines have been disrupted. We've got kids in a new school, a new program, swim and soccer and all these different things going on. We've got new health care forms. We've got all these different things. We've got paperwork for paperwork. It's absolutely crazy just going through big changes. Many of you have experienced the exact same thing I'm talking about. And then it hit me. Six months in, and I haven't set up any sort of recurring gift to the church myself. But there's disappointments. Our fridge went out. 
our fridge, that was a nice fridge, but such a lemon, and it was on its last leg, and now we have to buy a fridge, and that's expensive, and the kids are starting braces, and braces aren't cheap, and they're eight, but they need braces, which means two rounds of braces, which is more expensive, and if you hear me talk like this, here's the problem, you would think that I was barely getting by. And the reality is, is that the true story of the last six months of my life is that God has poured out tremendous blessing and provision in my life. God provided quickly for the sale of our home. He provided easily for us to move across the country. In a crazy housing market, we put two offers on houses. The second one was accepted for below market value. That doesn't happen. God has abundantly provided in such tremendous ways. He's surrounded us with community, with friends, with a job here at the church in an environment that I'm happy to share with you guys is a very healthy and enjoyable working environment. God has been so good in so many ways. And for me to just kind of back burner any sort of financial response to him is just kind of saying, you know what, God? Thanks for all you're doing, but it's easier for me to trust you when I hold on to this. And it's not just a sense of duty when it comes to giving, but honestly, what's missing out and a huge part of the disobedience is this. It's a lack of worship. It's a lack of trust. It's a lack of saying, God, in light of all that you've done for me, I will respond by giving back to you. And it was kind of a beautiful process this last week as God convicted me of it and provided the opportunity to say, God, there's disruptions, there's disappointments, but I won't choose disobedience anymore. I'll say yes to you. Are there areas in your life where you're choosing disobedience? Today, friends, we have the opportunity to say what Simon did right here. He said, Master, I'll be honest, I've worked hard all day and night, and we've caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down my nets. I can only imagine what may have happened or not have happened if he chose otherwise. But on this day, in this moment, Simon chooses wisely. I will do as you say and let down your nets. Friends, where is God calling you to let down your nets? to take a step of faith that maybe you've been hesitant to take. Well, after the disruption and disappointments, Peter's about to encounter the divine. Pick up with me in verse 6. It says, When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners, to the other boats, for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats that they began to to sink. This is great success beyond anything they could have imagined. This was a day in fishing that would go down in history. This was something they would never experience again. They were so successful it began to threaten their livelihood. The nets began to break. The boats began to sink. This is a fisherman's dream and it might just do them in. But it wasn't their success, was it? Because we read on and we see Simon's response to all of this. It says in verse 8, But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. This is not the response of just awesome, look at all these fish we caught, high five Jesus, way to go. Something strikes a deep chord within him. And it doesn't spell it all out for us, but if you start to put the pieces together, you realize Simon's livelihood once again was fishing. He'd invested in the boats. He'd invested in the nets. A catch like this was all he ever dreamed of. But the catch like this, once again, was tearing apart the nets, was sinking the boats. They had to call for help. They were in over their head. 
Why? Because this wasn't something they could have done. This was something only God could do. It says in verse 9 that amazement had seen, seized them and all of his companions because of the catch of fish that they had taken. This amazement was reverence. It was a sense of awe, a sense of unworthiness. It is what we refer to as the fear of the Lord. They, in that moment, saw something that only God could do. And it caused them to be overwhelmed by the presence of God. Have you ever experienced this in your life? There's a handful of times that I'd say I'd experience something like this. And it always came... It always came when I was worn down, disappointed, life was disrupted and not going the way that I wanted it to. It always included me being fully aware of the reality of my sin because the holiness of God was in clearer view than I'd normally see it. And in clear view of the holiness of God, it's not just high five Jesus, we caught some fish. It says, Peter said here, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Peter sees who he is in light of who Jesus is. And it's about to change everything. I have a friend. Her name's Amina. She experienced something similar, and I'd love to share her story with you. Take a look at the screens. My name is Amina Ghostin. I lost my sight when I was six years old. The blessing is, even though I was born at 23 weeks, the only side effect for me was blindness, uh, when there's so many things that could have gone wrong. Up until in my late 20s, I struggled with belief in God. For me, I would argue that my God was science and education and achievement. Early on in my life, I had I had a set plan for what I was going to do. I was going to go to college and I was determined to excel, especially with someone having a disability. I was determined to prove myself to my family and to society at large that having a disability doesn't stop you from leading a productive life. It wasn't until I came to Washington, D.C. I just felt this profound sense of loneliness. Even though I had achieved all the things I had said I was going to do, I just felt like I, there was something more to life than achieving, than um, a job, than education. That's more or less how I came to Christ. I I kind of remember the day because I had just gotten off the phone with my mother and she had just found out that she was diagnosed with cancer. I had heard about these assertions that God could heal and work miracles. And I said, well, I have nothing to lose. I'm going to um, embrace God and Christ into my life. But then, interestingly enough, um, all these coworkers just started coming into my life, mentors who were also fellow believers. And it just became a wonderful journey over, over the next four years as I was going through my mother's um, battle with cancer. Just know that in scripture, God is telling a story. And who doesn't like a good story? But this is like the best story of the ages. And you have the chance to participate in that story. I just felt like there was something more to life than achieving, she said. Now, I met Amina because as communications pastor, I'm in charge of our online service. And Amina is one of our online hosts. It's absolutely incredible. She can't see the computer screen. But she has a micro, or an earpiece that dictates to her everything that's happening And she can respond just as fast as you or I can on a computer. And what drove her to do that is when COVID hit and she realized that church was moving from in the building to online, she said, you know what? There's people out there with disabilities like me and God is calling me 
to make it easier for them to connect with Jesus. Absolutely incredible. You can actually go on the church's YouTube channel and see more of her story, and I encourage you to check that out this week. I love what she closed with. She said, this is the best story of the ages, and you have the chance to participate in that story. I felt like those words could have been taken right from what we're reading in the calling of Simon Peter. Because Jesus says something very similar in the second half of verse 10 going on to verse 11. He says to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Which, friends, in light of what they experienced that day, in my estimation, was the only logical response to it all. Yeah, we can go back to catching fish, or we can follow the guy who the fish listened to. I find it interesting because on that day, Jesus was the best fisherman on the shore, but it wasn't his intent that day or his purpose or his ultimate aim to catch fish. Jesus set out that day himself to catch men. He was looking for disciples, looking for people that would follow him into all different areas of life, into different communities, to walk a journey with him through some highs, some lows, some challenges, some teaching, some growth, to experience miracles, to experience transformation, to be a part of something that is like nothing else on this planet. And Jesus caught a few men that day. Simon Peter and the brothers James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And Jesus said to them, from now on you will be catching men. That thing that Jesus just did, of going out there on the shore, it just wasn't that he taught, he was looking for people. And he brought them in to his group of followers, his close-knit group of disciples And if you today are a disciple of Jesus Christ, the call is very similar. Not just to know about Jesus, not just to experience Jesus, but be a part of his mission of being a fisher of men. What strikes me as so interesting as well is that Jesus had a group of followers this day that wanted to listen to him. They were there at the lake, they were ready to hear his teaching. But not far off was a boat of fishermen. And Jesus in his divine wisdom knew, those are my guys right there. Have you considered the possibility that the next people in our world as a church, in your world, in your relationships, of experiencing someone who's on fire for Jesus Christ and making an incredible impact for the kingdom of God, that person may very well not be in this room right now. They may be out fishing right now on Burke Lake. They might be at home mowing the lawn. They might be at the pickleball courts. And friends, God is calling us today to follow in Jesus' shoes and be fishers of men. Because Jesus has an unstoppable purpose for you. Remember, he'll allow you to be disrupted, just as he did with Peter. Peter. He'll even allow you to be disappointed. But when you find yourself disrupted and disappointed, don't give up hope. In fact, be expectant. Because I firmly believe that Jesus, more often than not, is about ready to show up and show you more deeply and more fully what your life was meant to be. Are you ready to follow him today, friends? Join me in prayer. Father God, I just lift up my brothers and sisters in this room who are hearing this familiar message and wanting to say yes to what you have. God, bring clarity as to where you're bringing the discouragements and the disruptions in their life, the disappointments where you are helping them to say no and what you're helping them to say yes to. May this week be a life lived for them of just openness to your leading, to your guiding, to what you will call them to next 
And God, we know that you've already been prompting in many ways and that you have been sowing seeds, sometimes of discontent, sometimes of possibility. I pray that you would show my brothers and sisters what steps to take to say yes to you. Father God, I pray as well for those of you today who, like Peter, may know about Jesus but have yet to follow him. I pray that as they are just wrestling with who you are and what it means to follow you, that they would experience just the wonder and awe of your power and holiness. To not just know about you, but to know what it is to be before you and to have our souls just broken and crushed and say before you, not me, Jesus, I'm a sinful man. (laughs) Lord, may you pick them up, draw them near to you, call them to yourself, and may they experience the joy and abundance of new life lived in you. For all of us, God, may we draw near to the Savior this week and experience in him his unstoppable purpose for all of us. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, it's been a pleasure being with you this morning. I've enjoyed the opportunity to dive into the life of Simon Peter. I encourage you to take the next step with that and chew on that more this week. Maybe it's a conversation you have with people you came with. Maybe it's picking up the book in the bookstore. Maybe it's taking that challenge to take a step of faith and sign up for a table with five of your friends at the Global Leadership Summit coming up in August. Whatever that next step is, take it. God is calling you. He's leading you. Our nets are here. Our boats are here, and God's calling us out there. Let's go. Have a great week, guys. Look forward to seeing you soon.